So welcome everyone at the second joint meeting of the European Renal Association Young Nephrologist Platform and the European Society of Pediatric Nephrology uh, Young Pediatric Nephrology Network. Today, as last time, the webinar is focusing on the transition care from the pediatric to the adult nephrology care. And today we'll represent the patient's perspectives on Alport syndrome. I'm Oshia Czepleka, the actual chair of the Young Nephrologist Platform at the ERA, and uh, going to moderate the meeting with my co-moderator, Eugenia Preka, the chair of the ESPN YPNN. So our panelists will be Amarilis von Cranenbrook from Leuven, Belgium, who is an adult nephrologist and the past chair of the ERA YNP, and uh, Ruth Baita Baptista, the pediatric nephrologist from Lisbon, the Central Lisbon University Hospital, uh, center and who is the national representative of Portugal uh, at the uh, YPNN at ESPN. So I wish you all uh, a useful pastime during the next 60 minutes and uh, now I'm passing the word to uh, Eugenia. So please Jenny, please introduce our presenters and uh, welcome all the attendees on behalf of the European Society of Pediatric Nephrology YPNN. Many thanks, Orsi. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Virginia Precker. Um, I've also said I'm the chair of the Young Pediatric Nephrologist Network from uh, the European Society of Pediatric Nephrology and our uh, network. I would like to welcome everyone and thank you for being here with us today. We're very lucky to have three exceptional speakers today, and I'm really delighted to introduce them. So I'll start with the first speaker, who is going to be Rosa Tara. Uh, you might all know here is an adult nephrologist, chair of the Inherited Kidney Diseases Unit in the Nephrology Department of Fundación Puigverd, Barcelona, and she's professor of medicine at Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. She has a lot of research interest. Um, she has been involved in a lot of clinical trials, uh, especially ADPKD, Alport syndrome, ADPKD, tuberous sclerosis, among others. And um, from the pediatric nephrology point of view, we have with us uh, Rachel Lennon. Rachel is a professor and the director of the Welcome Center of Cell Matrix Research and she's an honorary consultant in the pediatric nephrology at the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital. Rachel and her fantastic team in the lab study basement membranes and specialize in matrix structure that surround the joint tissue compartments. And her primary focus um, of the group is the basement membranes in the kidney, which are affected in the genetic condition outward syndrome, which we're going to discuss today. And last but not least, we have with us Susie Gear. Susie is from Oxford in the UK, and Susie is a businesswoman that works internationally and was one of the founders of the Alport UK, which supports people living with Alport to have a brighter future. In her role as chief executive of Alport UK, Susie also facilitates an international collaboration, the Alport Syndrome Alliance, which is a global network developing treatments and knowledge. Many of Susie's family are impacted by Alport syndrome, and I'm really interested to all of their feedback today. So now um, that was for me, and I'm passing to our lovely panelist for the continuation of the presentation. Thank you. Welcome to all of you. Um, I'm I'm Ruth from the European Society for Pediatric Nephrology, and uh, as you know, today our conjoint webinar. Um, will um, be based on the, uh, the some pool questions that we would like to invite you to participate so that we can have a fruitful uh, discussion joining the views from pediatric nephrology and adult nephrology. And I'll pass the word to the other panelists. Uh, so Amaralis, if you Okay. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we spent a whole five minutes um, introducing ourselves. So we would also like to know, of course, who you are. Um, so we also checking, of course, the polling system. So uh, please reply on this um, ice breaking question. So you are participating in this webinar as one, a patient, two, an adult nephrologist, three, a pediatrician or a pediatric nephrologist and for um, other. So this gives us an idea uh, about the audience because we, you do see us, but we can't see you. But we have a uh, half-half spread between pediatric nephrologists and adult nephrologists. And I didn't see any patients, so uh, I think we are quite a medical uh, audience. 20%, I think. 
I think that was the other category. Okay, we'll come back uh, to this later. So maybe we just move on now. Okay, so moving to the next question. Uh, will you recommend screening for Alport syndrome uh, in a patient with persistent microscopic hematuria and or their first degree relatives, let's say a child, a parent, or a sibling? Option one, no, patients with Alport syndrome do not need follow-up until they become symptomatic. Option two, no, there are no validated screening methods in Alport, in Alport syndrome. Or three, yes, some patients with Alport syndrome will benefit from follow-up in early stages. Or four, yes, all patients at risk could benefit from follow-up in early stages. Okay, so the majority of our audience thinks the option is the fourth one yes all patients at risk could benefit from uh from follow-up uh could benefit from follow-up in early stages so let's see what the views uh from our speakers uh about this question uh hello thanks for the introduction and thanks to the audience for the great input uh i will start by setting some background uh You'll know there are three ways of inheriting Alport syndrome or collagen for nephropathies. However, we decide to call them. The x link is the most famous one, the one that patients always say, well, but look, males are more affected than females, right? Say, okay, yes, but only for this uh, type of Alport syndrome. Then we have the optimal dominant that we will talk about it and the optimal recessive with one mutation in each copy of the gene. But look at the, these huge differences. The risk of end-stage kidney disease is very high for X-link males and for the autosomal recessive, but very low for the autosomal dominant form, which at this very moment, I can tell you, I'm not very sure whether it is a disease or whether it's a risk factor, whether it contributes to other causes of CKD, it's really confusing because in a recent article from data from UK, uh, they showed us a prevalence of one every 106 individuals. So it's tough to say that one every 106 has a disease. For sure, they have not. So a disease is something else. So yeah, I put here in a table um, for the, I would say there are four patients with Alport syndrome, X-linked males, X-linked females, the autosomal recessive form, and this so-called autosomal dominant. So all of them have hematuria, except this one I just put, uh, wait, I just put one uh, plus because some individuals even do not have hematuria. For the autosomal forms, both uh, sexes are equally affected, of course. Sensory neural hearing loss is mostly found in some or a significant percentage of X-linked males and autosomal recessive and in some females, but not in autosomal dominant, same for ocular symptoms. And as mentioned before, the really, really severe ones are autosomal recessive and X-linked males, although some females also end up on dialysis, but very infrequently in the autosomal dominant form. So if we see that, that the autosomal dominant form has not extra renal features, is it really a syndrome? Well, a syndrome is something that uh, a set of medical signs and symptoms which are correlated with each other and associated with a particular disease. So in this third pattern of inheritance, we are not sure if it is a syndrome because we don't have we only have kidney involvement so far. Well, after this introductory aspects I'll go to the first question. So do we recommend screening in patients with persistent microhematuria? In clinical practice in reality in adults, not always because it's very common and if don't if they don't have a microbuminuria, they do not have relative affected relatives. We usually don't. I would say if genetic testing was like asking for a creatinine, for sure we would, we would, but uh, I guess that in most centers we don't. And uh, but but I'm especially concerned about females because they may have X-linked Alport syndrome and only have 
microhematuria, nothing else. So in terms of genetic counseling, that would be extremely, extremely necessary. So yeah, all would benefit, but because of cost and availability, uh, we don't in all adults. Okay, thanks, Rosa. So, um, I mean, I guess we've um, jumped into questions without a little bit of introduction, and I can't um, uh, attend a seminar without telling you about our our kidneys and glomeruli, which is where all of the uh, uh, the issues are happening there in um, the kidney for Allport syndrome. So, of course, you all know um, we have the nephrons as the functional unit of the kidney. Proximal end is the glomerulus. You can see the image here on the right. Um, and it's the capillary wall, which is the filter. Um, and that gray basement membrane that you can see between the green podocytes and the pink endothelial cells is where that really important type four collagen um, that's affected in all port syndrome is present. Um, and that's where it's disrupted. So on to the next slide. And we've heard from Rosa already in terms of the genetic basis there. Uh, so to make a collagen protein, you need three chains. Um, and the all port collagen is made of alpha three, alpha four and alpha five chains. And you need three genes for that. So that's that's the kind of reason why it all comes together, because these genes are required to make um, type four collagen alpha three four five. So that's that's an important message for for all port syndrome background understanding. Um, in terms of the presentation relevant for this particular question, of course, mi microscopic hematuria. And Rosa made a really good point that that's common um, as a, a as a feature that we'll find in in adults. And um, you know. Um, will have a number of different causes. So it's not, whilst it might be sensitive as a test for all port syndrome, it's not specific. Um, and so we've got to think about excluding other causes. Um, in pediatric practice, um, there are fewer of those additional causes, but there are still some other causes that we'd want to ex um, exclude before requesting uh, genetic testing. Um, in terms of the frequency, well, we're starting to learn more. Sorry, if we just go back to the previous slide, <laughs> we're starting to learn more um, with lots of whole genome, whole exome um, sequencing. Um, so if you just go forward one slide. Um, and these studies are, are helping us to understand the frequency of pathogenic, likely pathogenic variants in collagen 4. Um, and Rosa gave some of those numbers, which are really quite surprising for the autosomal genes, alpha 3 and alpha 4, so as high as 1 in 106 individuals with pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in those genes. Um, uh, so we, we have yet to understand what that means in terms of risk factor. Overall, having these genes disrupted leads to um, impaired assembly of type 4 collagen in our basement membranes. These affect the kidneys. They also affect the basement membranes in the cochlea, hence the sensory neural hearing loss, and some of the basement membranes in the eye, and, and there can be ocular problems as well. Um, so on to the next question, uh, slide, which is where I give my answer to this uh, first question. Yes, in my opinion, all patients at risk could benefit from follow-up in the early stages. Microscopic hematuria is sensitive, um, although, as Rosa mentioned, in those with a single abnormal copy of the gene, the alpha-3, alpha-4, um, it may be absent. Um, so it's sensitive, but it's not specific. So we need to think about excluding other causes. Our practice in Manchester for children and young people is we would, first of all, um, confirm that this is persistent microscopic hematuria over a period of six months, and we'd exclude other causes such as post-infectious glomerulonephritis, for example. Um, I'll just, I've got two quick slides to prompt your further follow-up reading, um, and this is two recent papers. So, so one, the next slide is on, um, whoops, that's a little bit yeah, there we are coming through now. Um, so that is um, one of many studies. This is actually from a Japanese cohort of patients, really highlights the reason we need to pick up individuals with Allport syndrome early because it there is something that we can do about it. Um, so 
a beautiful study from the team at Kobe University led by Tomohiko Yamamura, over 400 individuals um, separated according to the type of genetic variant they had, and then their responses to treatment. Um, and, and what we see from this study and others, there are many other um, similar studies across different populations now showing the same, that um, the type of variant matters. So if you've got a more severe variant, it's associated with more severe progression of the disease. Um, but treatment with an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker makes a big difference. You can see the survival curves here. Um, and what um, the rough number that I have in mind is that early um, initiation of ACE or ARB in an individual with Allport syndrome um, will um, enable an additional or, or will extend kidney survival by 10 to 15 years. And that's just with treatment with, with ACE or ARB. So that's important. That's a really important message to take away. Uh, the second um, paper for you to go away and read, it's um, from, on the next slide, um, from Michelle Rose Group in Minnesota. And this is looking in children uh, with hematuria and a family history of kidney disease. Um, so that's this kind of question, who do we test? And it shows us that they, the, gen, you know, the diagnostic yield in over um, 800 um, individuals, um, well, for the whole cohort, it was 28%. If there's a family history, uh, that comes up to 40%. Um, hematuria and he, um, hearing loss, again, uh, that narrows it, that, that increases it further up to 60%. Um, so it does tell us that actually, if we do test in certain circumstances, we're gonna get that um, uh, uh, diagnostic yield. Why is it important to have the genetic diagnosis in a family? Well, once you've diagnosed one individual, you can then extend and do what we call cascade testing um, in other family members. So I'm gonna stop there and hand over to Susie. Thank you um, very much to the RA and uh, ESPN for inviting us uh, to participate in this important discussion um, about transition for people living with Allport syndrome. Uh, so my mother had two kidney transplants back in the 1970s and 80s, and my female cousin was also diagnosed with X-linked Allport syndrome, and as a child had to have a kidney transplant and needed a second. And my sister and I were also diagnosed by genetic testing, but have milder symptoms. So you'll notice that we're all women with X-linked Allport syndrome um, and with different journeys. And so the, the first important message is that every patient, even within a family, is different. I also have three boys, two of whom have Allport syndrome, um, and the 25-year-old had a transplant two years ago, and my youngest, now 19. Um, indeed, we literally just dropped him at university in Scotland this morning, and he will dialyse tonight at a new dialysis unit. Uh, so I'm a tad more nervous than most parents who have young people starting at uh, uni today. Uh, but this discussion about screening is really needed uh, with the family and every family is different. Um, and we really encourage you to build a relationship with the family to discuss these kinds of topics. Um, and I, I really mean partner with them as if they were members of your team. Uh, some of our Allport patients will be very switched on about what screening is available in their country versus other countries. And the switched on ones are actually on our Facebook page is asking these exact questions. And our Facebook pages are very well moderated with expert input from professors around the world. And so some patients understand, really understand what is available to them. Um, but not every patient uh, is connected to the international community. And then your role as a kidney doctor Doctors, helping them realize there is an international community and international guidelines out there is really important. Your role to connect them with our community um, is vital. But I thought we ought to start. I, I don't know whether this video will work. We'll have a go because actually your decisions are impacting young people. And we've got a young person to tell us what it's like. I can see the video, but it's very, there's no sound and it's very slow. Uh, can anybody see anything different? Can you hear anything? 
I can't hear either, Susie. No, I, I think I think we should move on. And what we can do is put the video link um, in the uh, chat uh, for people because we've provided that uh, to to pa Paulina. So, um, wh what do we mean about your decisions impacting young people? Um, as the video will show you, Sam will tell you, he's an amazing um, filmmaker, so I really encourage you. It's a one minute video, so it's not um, uh, uh, overly, um, uh, uh, you know, so it's a fantastic thing to show your patients too. But it's really vital to protect kidney function for as long as possible, as in Allport syndrome, particularly X-linked Allport syndrome, of which there are probably majority of the cases. The kidney issues can particularly start in the late teens, just as the young people are moving from school to higher education, like my son. Uh, for example, he's a good example. They're starting relationships, their brains are rewiring and their hormones are out of control. It's a really busy time in their lives and their bodies, let alone having to add all port into the mix. So really early diagnosis and treatment with ACE inhibitors, as Rachel told us about uh, that wonderful Japanese study, and potentially other drugs that are coming out uh, onto the market. So, for example, we're familiar with things like the, the uh, tests on the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, and indeed, in the UK, we're starting children, um, younger people on some of those as well. It can mean or make the difference for a young person's kidneys that they can be protected enough, i.e. last longer, to get them through university so they don't have to go into kidney failure before, like my son, and give them the opportunity to find a job before they start having issues. And that gives them a better start in life. That's a great outcome for a person, um, not just a patient. But I think the whole principle as patient groups, we really encourage what Rosa and Rachel have said, really to screen people as early as possible, as the research has shows that the earlier people start ACE inhibitors, there is the potential to protect their kidney function for longer. It also can help a family start monitoring the hearing and potentially start using hearing aids at the earliest opportunity to minimize the impact of hearing loss uh, on schoolwork too. And that was done with my boys. They started wearing hearing aids um, before they were 10, actually. Um, children seem to be much more up for trying hearing aids as young compared with, with teenagers who suddenly get very self-conscious about appearance. So our observation as patient groups is that it's much easier for children um, if they're diagnosed earlier uh, to start those kinds of things because they become everyday things. My boys say that, you know, it's just a standard thing getting up in the morning to put your hearing aids and your glasses on now. You know, it's it's, it's not an issue. But if you do it as a, as a teenager, it's really, really hard to get those kind of behaviours um, into their lifestyle. Also, the whole business of screening and knowing can help those who suffer from anxiety. So it, it, your screening decisions can impact mental health. Knowing gives them an element of control of the situation. It reduces their anxiety and not knowing can have a massive psychological impact. But it is a choice thing. So it's I go back to what I started with. It's, it's about partnering um, with those um, people. Uh, to actually the, the the patients and their families uh, to help them make the de decisions. I put up a, a slide here. This is just a slide. Um, to be honest, Rosa has covered it already. It's a really good summary of all the different types and the modes of inheritance of Allport syndrome. And I know some of our patients have found it hugely helpful. And you'll see that the top Three versions, X-linked, autosomal, recessive and digenic, are all versions of Allport syndrome. As patients, we tend to talk about the autosomal dominant version um, as more as Allport, not as Allport syndrome. Because uh, what people are finding more and more um, through the testing is that their thin basement membrane disease or whatever actually shows, they the genetic testing shows they have an Allport gene. But... Um, it's very hard for them to think about it as Allport syndrome because, as Rosa identified, they don't necessarily develop the full set of features. But we do like to welcome them into the community as 
having all port, maybe not all port syndrome. Um, and it's a very subtle difference, but it's a very important one because it's also important for them to understand uh, that there is a very low risk of the autosomal dominant inheritance um, a pattern actually developing those further features that cause the syndromic features. And so it's a very important differentiation uh, that I can encourage you to, to think about and to understand. So I, uh, this really is just to summarize um, that this is about young people. We've got Rima and Noor on the left-hand side. And then we have my boys, Patrick and Jamie, and they're talking to Jack Tai, um, who lives in Beijing. And these young people are uh, in credit, um, engaging more and more about their condition so that they are becoming the experts. Um, and I really encourage you to think about them navigating their big life changes and the physiological changes and to choose a path where you partner with them because they will be patients with you for quite a long time. Okay. Well, let's move on then to the second uh, clinically important question. So would you inform a patient with Alport syndrome about the possibility of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, so PGD? The first choice is yes. I have to inform all my patients with Albert syndrome about PGD and help them with decision-making for family planning. Second choice, yes, but only if the affected patients with Albert syndrome is a male, as it is contraindicated in a woman with Albert syndrome. Third, no, PGD is not recommended in patients with Albert syndrome, never. And four, no, this is not the rule this is not our role, uh, not for a pediatrician, not for an adult nephrologist. Very curious. Okay, so I uh, saw so already that about more than 80% of the audience voted for one. So um, very happy with this, of course, that the, yes, 60, 86%. So yes, I have to inform all my patients with Albert syndrome. Okay, let's go to the evidence around this then? Well, that question, I think it's easy. Um, I would say, yes, always. I have to inform always my patients about PGD, but not only PGD. This is a very nice plot that we made for the KD on ADPKD, which is still, I mean, it's not public. This is why I put this logo there. But um, here we, we I, I change PKD by alpha. So we see the reproductive options. No testing is an option and accepting the, depending on the pattern of inheritance, the X percent chances of passing over the disease uh, of having a newborn with alpha. Then we also have without testing embryo or fetus, uh, the possibility of a sperm of egg donation, then the newborn would not have Alpor syndrome, but um, the egg or sperm donor will be the biological parent. Then we have the options regarding testing the embryo or the fetus. And uh, well, of course we have the PGD or PGD, which is what I would say nowadays it has a higher uptake. And then you have a newborn without Alpor syndrome. Um, we also have the, the possibility of prenatal testing, which means performing a chorionic virus sample at week uh, 11, more or less. And then if the embryo is affected, then you interrupt the pregnancy and you end up with a newborn with a palpor. So this uh, approach um, is maybe quite acceptable for patients with 25% risk of having an, an affected child, like autosomal recessive, or for those who say, I don't want to have a child with X link up, a boy with X link up or syndrome, but I'm fine with a girl, for example. So all these options should be um, offered or explained to, uh, to our patient. Yeah, <laughs> I added that because it is extremely difficult to do genetic counseling in the autosomal dominant form. Um, yesterday, for example, I, I was uh, with a patient of 31 years old with a GFR of 51, I think, and proteinuria around two grams, and he had only one heterozygous pathogenic variant. Um, he had kidney biopsy with FSGS. So 
yes, I, I can tell him, you know, it's optimal dominant, it's mild, but then he says, oh, look, not that mild. I will be on dialysis before my 40s. So um, it's it's extremely difficult because the variability within a family is huge. And although in general, it's very mild, you can never be sure what will happen, especially because we do not understand this disorder or this condition or this risk factor or whatever. So I just wanted to point this extreme difficulty for these patients. Excellent. And I'm going to be very closely aligned to Rosa's um, uh, comments there. I guess this is a really this question is a really good opportunity to highlight the important collaboration that we have with um, clinical genetics. And so um, in my situation as a pediatric nephrologist, then um, I feel it's a duty for me to understand what is available and to be able to pass on information that um, comes from families, whether that's directly about um, the individual individual that I'm looking after clinically or other members of the family. And so we work very closely with our uh, clinical genetics uh, department here and our genetic counsellors who would take up the further discussions about um, um, genetic testing um, um, and pre-implantation genetic uh, diagnosis. Um, and the reason that um, uh, we do have those collaborations is that we can't be expert in everything. And so it's important to make sure that our patients um, uh, have the access to the expertise they need um, and, are, and are, are able, therefore, to keep up to date with the with the options. Um, so the I guess not not exactly the the the, the uh, same question or focus, but um, related to what Rosa mentioned there about some of the more difficult um, situations with autosomal dominant Allport syndrome, where there's just one abnormal copy of a gene. Um, uh, and what do we do in that situation? Well, I guess there's a similar conundrum that we're starting to think about with neonatal whole genome sequencing, which is just uh, now underway as a pilot in the UK. Um, and the decision there in terms of notification about genetic variants is much clearer for males with X-linked Allport syndrome and individuals with autosomal recessive um, confirmed uh, genetic diagnosis from whole genome sequencing. So we can see that there's a much clearer route there to um, counselling and discussion. Um, and I would say that's the same here. Um, it's less clear for when you have a, a single abnormal copy of the gene. Um, but overall, yeah, I think we have a duty to our um, patients and families to be aware of what's available and to pass on um, to the experts. And I'll hand over to Susie. Thank you, um, Rachel and uh, Rosa. Well, I, I'm in, uh, um, I, I very much as a patient in agreement that PGD is a topic um, to raise with individuals and uh, families with Allport syndrome so that they know the options available to them. It's about helping people, particularly young people, know that they have a choice. Um, and I really encourage you, uh, we have a YouTube channel called Allport Workshops. Um, and we have a podcast about the genetics of Allport syndrome, family planning and PGD. Um, uh, and it's because it's a topic we get a lot of questions about. Um, and it's really good for them to hear in a clinic situation, as Rachel mentioned, the collaboration with clinical genetics is vital. But also then people forget the information when they get home. So actually directing them uh, to the YouTube podcasts and things are hugely helpful as well um, to help them in their decision making. And at Allport UK, we have a number of families who've successfully used PGD and had children who don't have Allport syndrome. And these families know that their children can grow up without having the lifelong issues to deal with. Um, but people forget that it's not just the kidney issues, but it's often the cumulative impact on a family of an inherited condition, unknown prognosis and isolation of living with a rare condition can have a massive impact on mental health. So there's a lot of different factors to, to consider around it. Um, but you also need to recognise that some people like our family, have grown up living with Allport. It is part of our lives. It's our normal. And we actively choose not to do PGD and to take what life throws at us and make sure that the boys, our boys, have all the information they need and are not isolated. 
So as a family, we feel we get more out of life living with our condition as we take nothing for granted. Uh, for example, my son, my elder son, was determined to get his MA in broadcast journalism. And so two days after his kidney transplant, which was in the middle of his course, in the middle of COVID too, he was on his laptop zooming into uni lectures using the hospital Wi-Fi and he got a first level degree. So if, if approached positively, their condition can make them more determined in life. So I think you have to understand that there are lots of different choices, lots of different journeys, and people can choose to, to, to approach things in different ways. And we actually work with our young adult group at Allport UK. They call themselves the Allport Avengers. Um, and they are aged 15. Uh, 16 to 35 and they have a whatsapp group and discuss these kinds of topics with their peers and some of the people on the group uh, used pgd to have a family and some of the age are thinking about having a family and we run a lot of in-person socials with this group organizing nights out so that they can openly discuss these kinds of topics with people like them um, who are experiencing um, the same kinds of things so again you know, we encourage you to partner uh, with, with the with the families and help them understand their options uh, and anticipate these kinds of topics and point them to the resources uh, to help them make the decisions. Uh, and we really encourage you to connect them with other people of their own age. Uh, find out if you have a support group in your country uh, living with the conditions so that they can discuss these kinds of their really big topics uh, with others living through the same condition. Um, there are some excellent organisations out there. For example, in Italy, uh, there's ASL um, uh, that has a superb mental health programme too and discusses these kinds of topics openly, uh, just as an example. I see Rosa has, a, has her hand up. <laughs> Yes, an extremely brief um, comment. I really thank you, Susie, for your comment, because for us as nephrologists, as physicians, many of us have a hard time. Uh, I don't particularly, but many do have a hard, hard time understanding how a person with a, a, a condition like this accepts passing over the disease. And I think it's extremely um, respectful. I mean, we have to respect that and we must understand that many people feel like you. I mean, it's not an exception, it's something common, and we should never give our opinion on that or force patients. I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much, Susie. Well, thank you for respecting that because it's it's a really interesting topic, isn't it? And I think you, your role is is such a pivotal role, um, but, but to do it in a neutral way so people can make decisions, you know, that's really hard, uh, really hard. I would have to say, you know, some of my family have achieved and contributed so much more in life and to the community that than most other people who don't have the condition. So, you know, it, it depends, doesn't it, on, on all the different situations. Uh, but we choose to embrace it with all the positivity that life throws us. There are much worse things in life to have. I think, should we move on um, uh, to, to the next question? Uh, so, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, in which of the following situations will you start an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker therapy at the time of diagnosis of Alport syndrome if the patient is between the age of one or two years and before the onset of microalbuminuria? Option one, in males with X-linked Alport syndrome. Option two, in females with X-linked Alport syndrome. Option three, in autosomal recessive Alport syndrome. Option four, in autosomal uh, dominant Alport syndrome with heterozygous variants in collagen 4, alpha 3, or alpha 4 chain. Or option five, which is basically option one and three together. Okay, so most people picked option one and three, so males with Alport syndrome plus um autosomal recessive uh awkward syndrome so let's see what our speakers have to say about this well, i have to say that it's very very unusual for us as adult backwards as adult nephrologists to see an adult patient with excellent Alport syndrome patient with 
uh, X-linked or recessive without microalbuminuria. It's extremely unfrequent. I mean, I cannot remember to have seen that. So um, I would say that we treat all X-linked and autosomal X-linked males and autosomal recessive males because when they reach the adulthood, they have albuminuria. But in general, in adulthood, we do not treat before the onset of microalbuminuria. Um, a high percentage of females and individuals with uh, heterozygous pathogenic variants in COD43 or COD44 never develop albuminuria. And this is the reason why we do not treat them. And also there is no evidence. Rachel will tell us about children, but for sure in adults, there is no evidence. Um, and that's it. So uh, I would say in adults, we treat when um, as soon as the slightest microalbuminuria appears. Thanks, Rosa. And mine, I, yes, yeah, so, so I would say that it's um, one and three for sure. Um, I'll come on to the next slide, showing you in the next slide some, some, um, uh, a useful paper for you um but i think it's oh let's go back sorry <laughs> um um just to the previous slide yeah i think what's always important when we're starting um early ace inhibition um it's important to discuss with um parents in in um and the family in um, in pediatric practice, um, because there are things that we need to think about and be careful of in terms of episodes of intercurrent illness with diarrhea and vomiting and um, and potential episodes of dehydration, where um, we would be a little bit concerned about um, the continued use of um, ACE inhibition in that in those circumstances. So I think. My personal practice is to um, to start as early as um, microscopic hematuria in males with X-linked Allport syndrome, and um, and at that point in um, also more recessive Allport syndrome because we know that they are the ones that are um, have the greatest risk of progression to kidney failure. And going back to those um, the study that I mentioned earlier and. Uh, the one that I showed you there from the Japanese cohort, but other cohorts uh, do exist, that really does highlight and tell us that um, this intervention makes a difference and it does extend kidney survival. So that's the basis for this. And um, uh, the evidence for pediatrics, um, if we go on to the next slide, is nicely summarized in this review. Uh, so there's a table here. So there's a review from uh, Cliff Cashton and Oliver Gross, that's the uh, reference for the review published, I think, in 2021. And this table one just gives a kind of summary of the indications um, and timing of treatment. Um, so the more severe individuals um, at the time of diagnosis, um, uh, wherever that might be, and for um, informative families when we know and test for um, the condition we can know when as soon as children are born um, uh, that they have the diagnosis um, and so um, as soon as we start to look for it we will find microscopic hematuria certainly in in males with X-linked Allport syndrome. And we'd say that's probably 100% penetrant under the age of um, five years as a, as a sign, microscopic hematuria. Um, for um, females with X-linked Allport syndrome, then the recommendation here is at the onset of microalbuminuria, as, as Rosa had said, and the same for autosomal dominant. Um, and, and what we're trying to do here is just preserve kidney function, native kidney function for as long as possible. Uh, but bear in mind the uh, potential side effects um, and times where you just pause therapy uh, for intercurrent illness. So that, that that's my uh, comments. I'm going to hand over to Susie again. Excellent. Um, thanks, uh, Rachel. Uh, so um, I, I guess I, I, I think Rosa and um, Rachel have been very clear on their views. I, I guess the, the subtlety that I'd add to it is that you really need to think of every case of Allport syndrome as individual and every person is different. So we're constantly getting people on Facebook who have slightly quirky um, uh, results 
um, and who don't necessarily fit the guidelines. Um, and so we really encourage you whatever to diagnose people as early as possible i hope you've got that message now as the research shows and that the earlier you start the medication as rachel says um, the longer it potentially has to protect the kidneys um, and protect the individuals um, and i think that the uh, we try and clarify with patients um uh, for example, women with X-linked Allport syndrome who maybe only have hematuria that they really don't need to start ACE inhibitors unless they have the proteinuria. You know, the, the subtleties are important to understand. I, I hope Rosa would agree around that. Um, but I know it's really hard for some parents as I had to, to get their children to take their meds at a young age. Um, but I have to say uh, there were lots of wonderful tricks that we found as parents that you could encourage. We're using a spoonful of honey or jam. Um, I know some hospitals in the UK actually help teach young people to take pills earlier. And, and actually, it doesn't seem to be an issue with young people. Uh, so uh, and I think speaking to the young people, they seem increasingly keen um, if something will help them to, to take it if they're treated in sort of an adult way and understand that it, it, it could benefit them. I know it's slightly outside the age range mentioned, uh, you know, the transition of young people in, in this seminar, but um, the only exception to being on ACE and ARBs is during pregnancy too. So young people living with Allport syndrome need counselling to understand that when they're pregnant, um, they actually need to stop their medication. Um, and it, again, coming back to this business of partnering with your young people uh, living with Allport syndrome and discussing these topics openly with them so that they understand um, all these different things. You know, Allport syndrome is a complex thing. And please, um, you know, I even encourage you to give your email addresses uh, to these patients so that they can email you with a question. Uh, we're doing this more and more in the UK and the doctors were very worried about giving their email addresses, but actually it's been the most useful thing because sometimes these young people have a really particular question at a particular time and they need a quick answer. And it really helps them gain confidence in the relationship between the two getting their answers. Um, and it helps them anticipate issues in their lives and getting answers. And it actually stops them getting into trouble, which costs you more time. It often creates more complicated outcomes um, as well. So I, that's the whole big thing about um, uh, uh, partnering around it. Um, and if you have any questions about Allport syndrome, please do reach out to us um, because we can always put you in touch with an Allport a support group or expert locally to you. We have an incredible group of colleagues um, like Rachel and Rosa who collaborate with us internationally. And we really encourage you to get your newly diagnosed families to get in touch with their local organisations or with the Allport Syndrome Alliance if there isn't one in their country. Uh, because connecting people who already have the condition actually helps people feel less alone and it can massively improve their well-being and outcomes as individuals and families as a result of connecting with others. Uh, it's really, really tough living with these lifelong conditions, but having friends and sort of family along the way, uh, you know, a problem shared is a problem halved, we say um, in the UK. Um, I guess the final comment really is just to thank you all um, who are diagnosing and looking after all port patients. Um, the teenagers may not be the easiest to work with. I know I, I've had three of them, um, but I know, I, however, if you can find a way to work with them and treat them as adults and work together, uh, you'll be able to help them massively in getting through this really critical stage where all port um, hits. Um, and I, I can't tell you how much if they go into approaching uh, they're all put with good mental health and good understanding. It really improves the outcome, the, the opportunity for them to get through dialysis in a positive way and also to take on the, the opportunities of transplantation to, to give them an opportunity to live the life that they want to live. So thank you for all that you do to help them. Shall I hand back because there may be some other questions or thoughts? I'm not sure that the final video will work. I think we should send the links. <laughs> Bless you. At this point, we, had some, we had a couple of questions in the Q&A box, but most of them uh, have been answered by Professor uh, Tora. Thank you very much. 
um if i if i'm not mistaken there are no more questions at this point uh in the q a box and um susie thank you very much for this excellent summary actually uh, by the end and um it was really de delightful to have all of you uh during this seminar so uh, i'd like to encourage everyone uh to to ask their questions if there are any because we uh, we have there's uh, there are two more minutes left so uh, if anyone would like uh, to add something to the seminar, uh, anyone? Yes, it I is. a question to our speakers. Yeah. If no one else. Would you like to comment on the early PROTECT trial um, about starting AC inhibition in children um, on the basis that it could delay the presentation of from microscopic material to material plus Proteinuria, because I think this is, it was very few patients, but um, yeah, anyway, I would like you to comment on that, if that's all right. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny, for picking that one up. It's it's definitely referred to in the last reference that I had mentioned there, but I didn't mention that study by name. So this was the study that uh, uh, was actually quite difficult to recruit to, and therefore has relatively small numbers, because what the study was trying to do was ran, ask the question, um, if we start um, ACE inhibition before the onset of even microalbuminuria in the under in in children going down to the age of two, um, does that make a difference? Does that extend kidney survival? Now, of course, to be able to answer that question in terms of declining GFR, that's a very long term study. Um, and so, what this study was able to um, reassure us about was actually starting ACE inhibition. Um, with microhematuria as young as the age of two uh, was safe. So it was not associated with um, adverse effects and there weren't um, documented episodes of um, acute kidney injury that differed from um, the treated to the uh, placebo uh, group. And the other thing that actually this study was led, I have to say, by Oliver Gross and team at, uh, in Germany at Göttingen. Um, and what Oliver did as what, what the team did as part of that study was also include registry data. Um, from the US and is the, the team are continuing to collect data from a number of different international registries so that we do get prospective information about the safety of using ACE inhibition and, you know, um, all of the other treatments coming down the line, SGLT2 inhib inhibitors, venenerone, et cetera. So, um, so, so that's just a real flag for us um, uh, discussing registry recruitment with our um, families, um, because these really do help us to understand more about the safety and efficacy of treatments. I agree. Thank you very much, Rachel. Yeah, I, th I think we, we have one or two questions in the Q&A that are uh, still to be answered. Um, so, one of them is uh, when to start checking for uh, hematuria in the children of a mother with uh, X-linked Alport syndrome. So I tend to um, test as soon as we can get a sample <laughs> um, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of urine um, dipstick and, and, you know, generally that's, um, you know, between the age of one and two um for um uh, in terms of testing the urine so it's when you can get the sample in terms of the genetic um testing um then we can do that as soon as um as soon as we see the patients in the clinic and, the, and i think the second part of the question is when do you stop uh looking for a material let's say in the first uh, the first time you check it you don't have material for how long you need to keep checking for a material until you're you're safe that the child does not have the disease? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think it's not 100% penetrant um, in those with um, single abnormal, so heterozygous um, um, or port variant. So, um, so um, I think most of us would, uh, yeah, I, you'd want, so, so I think it depends on the situation. If you're um, referred a patient, you're looking after a patient with microscopic hematuria and you have run through um, 
uh, other causes and excluded those, um, then I, you know, if you've got hematuria that is persistent, although intermittent, I would then still use that as the trigger to test, um, do the genetic testing. Uh, so it's perhaps a low threshold, but that's um, that's our practice in Manchester. Uh, we should close our uh, session today, but uh, we were really delighted to have you all, all the presenters and uh, our patients, uh, Susie, today. And um, on behalf of the Aero Vine P, I would like to gratefully thank you for participating today. Uh, we all learned uh, pretty much. And uh, yes, so that's why we are here. And uh, that is uh, why uh, we are doing our vocation actually to, to, to live and learn lifelong. So I'm passing the word uh, to, to Jenny and uh, I would like to thank you and uh, have a pleasant day. Thank you. Thank you, Orsi. Very quickly to remind the audience that uh, this session will be recorded. And if you are a member of one of our societies, you can say that uh, at a, another time as well. Um, I also find a very fruitful um, uh, seminar and I'm delighted because I think it's very important for both specialties to have uh, the perspective of the adults of the other side for us and you guys from our side perspective. Thank you everyone for attending and looking forward to uh, our next joint webinar.